right. Welcome everybody to today's Nap Time Davis. I'm going to hand the mic over. Oh, I should introduce myself. I'm Michelle Tobias. Um, you all know that by now, I think, if you're regular. Um, I work at Data Lab. Um, I'm going to pass the mic over. We've got this snazzy giant mic today for uh, Roomland. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic over to Lupe, and she's going to introduce our speaker today. So here you go. Feel free to Thank sing you. if you'd like. It seems like it's sing. Needs, okay, we're good. Like it needs some pop uh, action here. <laughs> Okay, so I'm really excited to introduce CJ. I actually met him at AAG last year um, in Colorado, and we kept in touch and both were like, wait, I want to follow your work, so let's let's make sure that we're in our net, you know, keeping each other in our network. So I'm excited to be bringing him here to Davis virtually, <laughs> hopefully next time in person. But I'm really excited about this and um, yeah, getting to hear more about your work today. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, so CJ is a PhD candidate at Montclair State University, as well as the lead instructor for the university's introductory GIS courses. His research interests revolve around environmental justice, big data, and urban geography. But his current project focuses on the integration of internet search into lead poisoning detection tools. Um, for this session, um, he'll delve into the intersection of critical geography, GIS, and then transformative impact of big data and artificial intelligence, which is a big um, topic for Davis folks right now as well. Um, participants will be asked to consider contemporary challenges and ethical considerations present when working with spatial data sets particularly in the context of emerging technologies. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, CJ, um, who has prepared this wonderful presentation for us for folks who are either GIS professionals or also just interested in the field. Um, I know that this is going to be a good opportunity to explore spatial technologies, as you mentioned, and for so socially conscious and critical perspectives, which is really exciting. So thank you so much, CJ, for again joining us, and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Lupe. Thank you for that introduction. Um, thank you, Michelle. Thank you to Map Time Davis for having me. Um, I'm really stoked to to be here and to get to present on this stuff. Um, I, like Lupe said, my name is CJ. Um, my legal name is Charles, so I pop up as Charles in all of my research. Um, but I've been called CJ my whole life. Um, I answer to both. My advisor calls me Charles. Everybody else calls me CJ. My goal in life is just to one day be called doctor. So that's what we're striving for. Um, but I am so excited to talk about this today because this is a topic that I am, am genuinely just constantly so excited about. And so the fact that Lupe said, you can talk about this for two hours straight and nobody's going to stop you is perfect for me. Um, I'm super, <laughs> super excited to get to go into depth on this stuff. Um, diving right into just kind of the structure of this presentation, of this workshop, we are broadly going to cover a lot of these topics. Um, so I'm going to introduce each of these things in turn, critical GIS, uh, big data and AI and GIS, and then combining the two to practice critical GIS in the era of big data and AI. Um, and with each of these sections, I am going to, to give a definition, I'm going to give an overview, and then I'm going to pull some example papers that I think really uh, convey the, the key points for each of these things. But I am not going to get super technical. I'm not going to cover everything about all of these things. I'm not just going to list AI tools and big data sources for you. Um, I'm not going to go into coding and to get really, really nitty gritty with some of this stuff. Um, my goal is to ensure that anyone from any field with any level of experience with GIS should be able to pick up what I'm putting down from this presentation. Um, and with that, I, I do wanna acknowledge that we are going to do a little bit of hands-on work in the, the last section here, um, but it's not going to be uh, heavy demonstrations. Um, I'm just gonna give you some pre-generated, anonymized and aggregated big data to try to explore in ArcGIS online. If you're not familiar with the platform, no worries. You just need to know how to zoom in, zoom out. That's kind of the main thing. Um, I'll do some click by click for showing how to display things in interesting ways to do some comparisons. Um, and then I'm going to end with showing you how to use the tool Google Trends to uh, generate your own big data that's been aggregated already, but can be really informative nonetheless. 
Um, and I'm also just going to talk through some different things to consider when working with that kind of data for doing GIS work or for doing research. So with that, I am going to try to keep an eye on the chat as best I can if there are questions there. Um, I've got the camera positioned in the corner now too, so I can see all in the room wave at me um, if you need me to pause for any reason or if you have, hey, or if you have any questions <laughs> as we're going along. Um, I'll leave time for questions at the end as well. Um, I will try to not take all two hours just talking at you straight. Um, I'll do my best, I promise. Um, so moving on to the introduction, first and foremost, Lupe talked a little bit about my background already, um, but I want to provide just a little bit more, just quick overview of who I am. Um, so I am a PhD candidate. Um, I go to school at Montclair State in New Jersey. I study environmental justice. I study data. Um, I work a lot with spatial statistics and simulations. My background before that is I studied international relations and policy. Um, I went to Chico State, so I was up north in California. Um, I, after graduating, I worked at the uh, California Department of Conservation for a little bit doing an internship. Um, and then I actually worked at the uh, Temple Coffee Shop in Davis for about a year and a half. So I was hanging out in y'all's neck of the woods for a little while. Um, after that, I worked at a nonprofit for a little while that was focused on EV adoption based out of San Diego. Um, and all of that experience, um, particularly in the policy realm, was why I came back for a PhD. Um, I'm really excited about policy and theory, but the application is something that I always saw falling flat in ways that I was surprised by. And so I wanted to spend time studying environmental policy and finding new ways to implement tools and implement policies in more effective manners. Um, with all that as well, I am from California originally. Uh, I grew up in Folsom. Uh, I went to Chico State. I lived in the East Bay for a little while. Um, currently, I'm living in New York. One day, I'm going to get back to California, I assume, because I like biking and hiking and camping and being outdoors. And that's not necessarily here, but it's still fun while it lasts. A um, couple other fun facts about me. Uh, I like rock climbing. Um, I have a cat. His name is Mowgli. He is my co-author, my co-conspirator, my co-pilot. Um, and he will probably jump up from my feet onto the desk at some point. I apologize if he starts typing or just gets in the way. Um, he discovered that there are pigeons outside the window on the other side of the screen. And so he's been really focused on that. Um, and then another fun fact, um, I got married this last year to a best friend. That was back in June. We got married in California. So I've been living it up in New York, just enjoying the married life. Um, all of this background I am providing to you um, in particular because what we are talking about today is bias and critical assessments in GIS, in big data, in AI. And so I want to characterize myself a little bit to help you provide some context for the information that I'm bringing, for the arguments that I'm making, for the tools that I choose. Because when we are seeking to consider bias in all of these different facets, it has to be recognized that I am bringing my own bias to the table as well. I am a white, heterosexual, cisgendered man who is talking to you about equity. Um, so that is something that needs to be taken into consideration as I'm having these conversations as well. On the GIS side of things, um, I have four years of consistent GIS experience. Consistent meaning that I have ArcGIS Pro or QGIS up on my computer at least once every other day. Um, if not once a day. Uh, I do a lot of contract work. So I've worked with the state, with the federal government. I've worked with individual companies. I've done site assessments, site selection, site impact. Um, I study a lot of hazard things and I've done work with emissions inventories. Uh, but I also do a lot of research, obviously, as a PhD student. Uh, I've got a couple of papers published at this point, only one that really heavily features GIS, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but GIS is something I am very excited about. Uh, at our university, I am known as the GIS guy and the environmental justice guy. So whenever you need one of those things, people find a way to track me down. Um, I initially learned how to use GIS and how to work with ArcGIS Pro through the UC Davis Coursera course. So again, kind of coming home again. Um, and I primarily work with ArcGIS Pro and a little bit of QGIS, but mostly mostly the Esri suite. Um, all of this is to say that with my background, with my experience, um, with what you know about me, there are two primary things that you should know about what I believe in GIS. 
And that is that I believe that whatever it is you're doing, whatever it is you're interested in, there is a map for that. At all times, I believe that GIS has a place as long as there is something spatial in nature, we will find a way to make GIS a part of it. But with that, I also believe that every map is wrong. I firmly believe that uh, maps as a human construct mean that we are always integrating bias, we are always losing information, and we are always misconstruing something, misconstruing something. It's just a matter of figuring out what that is and how much it is impacting our results. Uh, so those are the two things that I am carrying with me throughout this presentation. Bear in mind that I believe both of those things to be true at the same time. Keep in mind. Um, with regards to the overall purpose of this workshop, um, I love GIS, I love environmental justice. Those are my, my fields, those are my topics. Um, but I am getting to be more interested in artificial intelligence and big data. Um, why is this something that I think is important to talk about? Well, from a very broad perspective, it is something that is increasing in popularity exponentially in the most recent years. Uh, this graph is just the relative search frequency for the term artificial intelligence. Beginning from 2004 and going forward, you can see after October 2021 there, we have a very gradual rise into a massive spike. Um, there has been a lot of interest in this. There has been a lot of tools being developed and things are happening very quickly at a point where um, it makes you wonder how much consideration is being put into the tools that we are developing. Uh, the same can be said for GIS. We are using a lot of AI and big data sources in a lot of GIS work nowadays. I, in particular, am very excited about this stuff. I'm always trying to integrate some of these things into my work. But in doing so, we have to acknowledge and identify bias that we are bringing with it in order to draw effective conclusions and avoid perpetuating bias. Uh, so the overall purpose is to go through these sections. We are seeking to understand critical GIS. I'm going to give a background about this. I think that everybody that's done a little bit of GIS has touched on critical GIS at least a little bit, um, but I'm going to revisit it. I'm really going to hammer it into your head. I'm going to hit it home. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about relevant trends in AI and big data with regards to GIS in particular. And we're going to bring everything together to help you to prepare to capitalize on and challenge AI and big data in GIS. Again, I'm not going to list all the tools, all the sources. I'm not going to tell you all the reasons that you need these things in your life if you want to do GIS. Uh, instead, I'm just focused on giving you an outline of the types of AI and big data that exist. And then I'm going to try to equip you with the knowledge needed to critically assess how those tools are working when you are working in GIS. And one last part of the introduction, um, I think that this quote does a really good job encapsulating um, why I believe this is such an important thing to be discussing. Um, it is a very chilling quote in, in my mind, um, and that is map or be mapped by Stone from a publication in 1998. This quote was applied in a 2004 research paper, which I'm going to cover shortly, that was inquiring about the role of GIS in mapping historically marginalized groups, and in particular, indigenous people. The quote goes, the problem that faces indigenous peoples worldwide is to find a way to incorporate Western geospatial tools and cartographic multimedia while minimizing the mistranslations recolonizations and assimilations of conventional technoscience. As Stone writes, map or be mapped. This is from the Pearson Lewis article from 2004, which I, again, I'll talk about very shortly. Uh, but this original quote is 26 years old and still rings true today. Authors, authors here were referencing this quote in the context of emerging GIS popularity. But I would contend that this same thing can be said for artificial intelligence and big data today. Right or wrong, I believe that the cat is out of the bag. Whether or not we want to participate in the development of these tools or the conversations about their use will not stop them from happening at this point. Both artificial intelligence and big data are reflections of us as humans, which means they're capturing and amplifying 
prejudice, every shortcoming, every institutional failure that we don't explicitly program out. So again, I am not advocating for the further adoption or use of big data or AI tools. I believe they have their place, but I am advocating for engagement with them. We as researchers and equity advocates shouldn't be striving to have a seat at this table. We should be driving these conversations before things get out of hand. On that cheery note, um, let's get into actually talking about critical GIS. Um, I'll give a quick definition. I'll give some examples. Uh, and I do want to apologize for my pronunciation of some of the words from languages that I'm not familiar with. Um, I've done my best to figure out how to pronounce things correctly. I studied Spanish and Italian, so I really like consonants. Um, and I have a hard time not pronouncing consonants, so I will do my best. Um, I don't think that I really need to spend too much time on a GIS definition uh, for people that are, are frequenting this group, but from a high level, GIS is geographic information systems. It's a system that creates, manages, analyzes, maps, all types of data. GIS connects data to a map, integrating location data, where things are, with all types of descriptive information, what like at those locations. We're talking about a combination of software, hardware, and data to create layers that we can then use for analysis. We are really taking information from the real world, seeking to create layers out of that and analyze that data, visualize that data in order to convey information and tell our stories. Critical GIS, defining it can get a little tricky because it has had a lot of different definitions over the years. Um, there are a lot of things that you can infer just from that name, critical GIS. Um, so with that, one of the most common definitions is just thinking critically when conducting GIS work. Not wrong, not informative, kind of works. Um, critical GIS is often conflated with GIS science, which is just conducting science using GIS, uh, implying, imploring scientific tools and the scientific method when using GIS. Um, they can be practiced together. They do not have to be practiced together. Um, but generally speaking, critical GIS generally involves the acknowledgement that all maps are a human construct. And so they cannot be a factual representation of reality. And see, that's, that's my bias coming through. I believe every map is wrong and a human construct and so on and so forth which is why I get so excited about this stuff. But the reason that this is important is studies that focus on critical GIS typically focus on challenging traditional facets of GIS and geospatial data, uh, talking about challenging vocabulary, practices, uh, visualization, analysis. It is aimed at rethinking the way that we are utilizing GIS tools and techniques in order to improve upon the final results that we are drawing. In particular, um, we're usually talking about one of two things, often a combination of both. Um, critical GIS studies will think about how to rethink how we create maps, trying to come up with new ideas for those vocabulary, for those implementation of tools. Other studies will focus on challenging existing maps challenging existing conclusions that we've drawn using GIS in order to gain new understandings that are better representative. Um, critical GIS is also has a focus on challenging the adoption of GIS as a technoscience. Technoscience is this idea that the technology itself has become the embodiment of science. Um, so where we can conduct science using GIS it is not fair to say that using GIS is inherently science. So we have to be careful about that fine line that we aim to walk. A lot of people adopt GIS and say, this is scientific and the results that I have are scientifically sound simply because I used these tools. So with this definition in mind, I want to turn to that first example publication. Um, I'm going to try to move kind of quickly through these, but I want to ensure that I am accurately conveying uh, what the authors were intending with these as well. This first paper is called Mapping Indigenous Depth of Place. It is by Pierce and Lewis in 2008. This paper is an example of, of rethinking how we create maps to better represent those who we are mapping. 
So in this case, the authors acknowledge the role that GIS and other technologies have played in protecting indigenous sovereignty, but they simultaneously point out the inappropriate use of these tools negatively affecting the expression and presentation of cultural knowledge. On the one hand, cultural heritage has to be tangible in order to take advantage of emerging Western institutional mechanisms of protection. On the other hand, mapping indigenous cultural knowledge leaves it vulnerable. Historically speaking, putting things on the record leads to a loss of indigenous resources and often a degradation of oral traditions. So to explore this intersection, to try to find a middle ground, the authors look at an example of an ahupua, which is a re resource management area in Hawaii that demonstrates how the innovative use of cartographic language and practices can better express cultural knowledge of natural resources. So this map right here, this is a map of Nua Lolokai. This is specifically a resource management that is a half mile long narrow strip of shoreline on Kauai. It is located at the base of steep cliffs and is historically a fishing village. This map in particular is a USGS map. The authors contend that this map is seasonless. It is timeless. It is confined. It is, has a viewer from nowhere. This captures the Western convention of depicting space as universal, homogenized and devoid of human experience, which is something that does not align with the Hawaiian culture and understanding of space. The authors show that by shifting to an oblique perspective, they can highlight the vitally important cliff sides and give the perspective of someone who might actually visit the location because it is traditionally only accessible by sea. Additional figures were used to show the movement of the sun of different seasons. In particular, the movement of the sun in the winter allows for the lack of sunlight to be displayed, which is vital for germination, which is a part of the process for revitalization in these areas. Figure 10 at the bottom here also shows that not only is the sun angle important, but also the shifting tides. As the tides recede, marine sources are trapped in various tidal pools and gathered as part of the day's food preparation. Overall, the authors show that these shifts in perspective and orientation remove the authorlessness of the map as well as the human emptiness of the map. We get to see this place from someone's point of view. And in some respects, we're able to capture traditional performative cartography connecting the map maker with the audience by incorporating everybody into the map. As a whole, these changes better capture Hawaiian traditions. They capture experiences and history. Uh, we take a step closer to creating a map that identifies the significance of this place for the purposes of preservation, while simultaneously preserving the humanity and provoking the viewer to consider the space in a new way. And importantly, None of this required new data sets. It simply required reframing and rethinking using existing tools. I've got one more example publication for Critical GIS. Uh, this one's a little bit closer to home for y'all. This is the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project, Counter Mapping and Oral History Towards Bay Area Housing Justice by authors Mahawawal and McElroy in 2018. The, this is an example of counteracting existing mapping bias and retelling stories with new voices. In this case, countermapping can take a lot of different forms, and we're going to see each of those in this individual publication. So the Anti-Eviction Mapping Project is a data visualization, data analysis, and oral history collective documenting gentrification and resistance in the San Francisco Bay Area around 2013. Overall, the idea for this project was sparked from the Tech Boom 2.0, where the rise of tech companies in the Bay Area led to big influxes of real estate interest. In particular, one of the things that drove the authors to start this project and to do these analyses were projects like the luxury apartment complex NEMA, who released a map reimagining downtown San Francisco, where they erased Chinatown and they erased the Castro and instead created a new neighborhood that they called the Eureka Valley in Dolores Heights. 
This was a form of erasure for locals that the authors thought needed to be counteracted. So the first step in this project was to make tangible that erasure to show that this was happening in an analytical way. To this end, the authors mapped what are called no-fault evictions from 2011 to 2013. No-fault evictions are essentially evictions that occur not as the result of breaking any kind of rules or breaking the terms of the lease, but are instead a, meant to be a more of a natural eviction, whereas somebody comes to the end of their term or their lease is simply not renewed and they're not given a reason for why that is. The authors plotted these, uh, these no-fault evictions across the years and associated them with what were called tech bus stops. These tech bus stops were essentially locations that tech companies had plotted out to have their own buses, their own shuttles, come out to pick up their own employees and take them to their campuses. So these were not using traditional bus stops, traditional public transportation. These were brand new and were specific to tech companies. And comparing the distribution of no-fault evictions to these bus stops, the authors found that 69% of the no-fault evictions were within four blocks of those tech bus stops. In this way, the authors were finding uh, a route to be able to show that this was something that was happening, that it was tangible, and they wanted to show that it was possible to say the quiet part out loud. The authors also took a couple of different approaches for this project. They also fostered some art projects seeking to inform and empower tenants. Um, in addition for this mural here, in addition to depicting evictions across the city, the mural features nine portraits, each paired with a five minute oral history clip. So essentially these images are from individuals who were evicted and you are able to go to this wall. There's a phone number on the wall. You can call in, you can punch in the number for the individual and you hear their story about their experience with eviction or their experience with resisting eviction. The mural also featured a portrait of Alex Nieto, who was a Latino man killed by the San Francisco police in 2014 in Bernal Heights Park when his security guard taser was mistaken for a gun. This mural was intended to take traditional mapping practices and add a layer of humanity to it that ensured that the information they are seeking to convey and the stories that have been turned into numbers are told in a unique manner that is still tangible. Finally, the authors also created a public participatory, mapatory, participatory mapping experience in Oakland to foster resistance for displacement. This was a collaborative map aimed to reframe representation of spaces of gentrification and struggle in Oakland. Uh, essentially what they did was they created this base layer map of Oakland that was hand drawn by the team for the art installation as well as for the project. The gallery visitors that came to see this installation were then able to add their own uh, considerations for assets and markers of community power to this map. At the end of the project, this map was digitized and made online, uh, available online to residents to ensure that it was set in stone. So with that, what we take away, what I aim for you to take away from this thinking about critical GIS is these two things, is that maps are a human construct that deserve to be challenged with the intention of rethinking, revisiting, and evolving the ways that we do GIS. These are the ideas that I want you to capture and take with you as we get into talking about big data and artificial intelligence. And at the end, we will put all that together and put it into action a little bit to see how they all converge. So moving on next to GIS, big data, and AI, I'm first going to talk about artificial intelligence. Um, I'm going to spend more time on big data. The reason being these two things go hand in hand. Artificial intelligence is quite often used to analyze big data. It is tough to analyze big data when you're not using some form of artificial intelligence. So I'm going to look more at the application of analyzing big data using these tools because I see a little bit more of that popping up in GIS on the research side of things, but I'll talk about both. Quick definition of artificial intelligence. Um, in this case, we're generally talking about software that is used to perform tasks or produce output previously thought to require human intelligence. That's just an Oxford dictionary definition. 
overall, these are kind of the two things that we're thinking about with artificial intelligence in GIS. We're thinking about expediting a task and we're thinking about creating a new data or insight from existing data sets. Those are the two things that most of these tools I'm going to talk about do. They do them to different degrees. Sometimes they combine the two, sometimes it's just one, but usually it's just one of these two is, is in there somewhere. Um, under the umbrella of artificial intelligence, there are a lot of different types of artificial intelligence, and I'm not going to list all of them there. I'm just going to kind of highlight some of the, the bigger ones that I think are very present right now, especially in GIS. Uh, the first is natural language processing. This focuses on enabling machines to understand, interpret, and generate human language. Think chat GPT. Uh, machine learning is the next one I want to point out, and this I have starred because I'm going to talk about it a lot. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence that involves training algorithms on data to learn patterns and make predictions or decisions without explicit programming. The way I often see machine learning is it is statistics on steroids a lot of the time. Um, what we are using it for in the GIS realm um, is often classification. And that is something that we've seen for quite some time. Machine learning has been very popular in GIS for that. Um, I'll talk about that more in depth, but we are going to, to hit it plenty. That's it's gonna be a big one. Uh, deep learning. Deep learning is a specialized form of machine learning that involves neural networks with multiple layers. Um, it's usually used for large amounts of unstructured data, images, audio, text, uh, and then computer vision and speech recognition, we're usually talking about uh, systems that interpret and make decisions based off of visual or spoken data. And again, there's plenty, plenty more. Um, these are some of the, the bigger ones, some of the broader umbrellas. Absolutely, there are more beyond this, but these are the ones I'm, I'm primarily going to be talking about. Let's see what we do in GIS. Uh, the first one, the most obvious, the one that has been around for quite some time is image classification. When I say image classification, I am talking about machine learning. I'm talking about very often using uh, satellite imagery just like this. This is Newark, New Jersey. Um, and this is just as all rasters are in GIS. It's just a collection of pixels. Um, I am fully capable of going by hand, zooming into each of these areas and trying to digitize this map to identify, hey, this down here is water, this over here is a building, this is asphalt, this is grass or trees. I can digitize things by hand, going piece by piece if I wanted to. But machine learning is something that we have available to us to expedite this process. The way that this process works is I simply will go through and create training samples where I teach the program, hey, this area right here is grass. This area right here is water. This is a building. This is asphalt. I create multiple examples for the algorithm to work with, to train on. And once I have trained it, I can actually run the algorithm and it will attempt to digitize the entire map for me. Because it is just a ton of little pixels, it does its best. We can retrain and retrain and retrain to try to improve on these images. But overall, this starting point is already saving me hours of work. Whereas if I had tried to do this by hand, I would be just staring at the screen, losing my mind, trying to do each of the little areas by myself. So this is an older form of artificial intelligence that's been present in GIS for quite some time already. The next thing I'm gonna to touch on is interpolation. Interpolation is another popular one that's been around for a little while. Um, this falls still into that realm of machine learning. Uh, when we're talking about interpolation, what we mean is we are taking individual points of data and trying to infer what the data looks like beyond those points. So in the case of this map, we have individual air quality monitoring stations that are positioned all across New Jersey. These stations collect information about AQI and were averaged annually. These differing colors represent differing AQI levels. This is helpful, but it does not give me a continuous data set. It does not tell me what air quality is across the state of New Jersey. It just tells me what it is at those points generally. 
So what we can do is using interpolation tools, we can actually expand the data and try to predict what values are beyond those individual points. This process involves looking at the area between the two points and estimating how the values are changing between those areas and looking at how the data has changed between other points in the past. So we use training information in order to infer what things are like in areas that we're not so sure about. Here we get into a little bit more of the modern integration. Um, this is not something that is groundbreaking necessarily because we are working with code in GIS sometimes. The nice thing about this though, is that when we are working with natural language processing uh, AI, we have this opportunity to generate code in a quicker fashion by simply asking chatbots to create a code that does X, Y, Z. Uh, when we're talking about ArcGIS Pro and we're talking about QGIS, there's often a, some ability that we have to be able to jack in with uh, coding so we can actually get up the code interface. And without ever even opening the program, we can run a Python script, an R script, a, a um, SQL script that will run a GIS analysis for us and give us the output without ever having to actually open the program. Now, again, as with everything that these chatbots do, they are good at some things. They are not so great at other things. Generally speaking, you can use this to create code that is going to help you to do simpler processes. But at the end of the day, as you get into some more complex things, they aren't quite as good at solving those issues. And they'll run into problems that if you don't have some familiarity with GIS or with the coding, it can be tough to debug. So simpler things, it's nice to be able to expedite this work. I certainly use this to improve some of my code and to generate some of the simpler things. Um, and it is increasing accessibility in some senses where you don't have to be an expert in code to be able to automate processes in GIS anymore. You can just rely on this for some of the basic automation. Along the same line, uh, interface integration is getting to be very popular. This is the exact same idea, just cutting out the middleman. Here, all we have is the chatbot and the GIS interface. And we combine the two, typing into the chatbot saying, I want a map of the United States uh, with population as the symbology. And it will create that immediately for you right there in the program and give you the visuals immediately. Same issue here. Um, it is something that is beneficial. It can do simple things. It can expedite some processes that might take more time. Um, but as we get into more complex things, it starts to fall apart a little bit. It's gaining popularity, but it is not at the point where it is able to take over for uh, a GIS analyst necessarily. The last big one I wanna to touch on, um, this comes specifically from Bunting Labs AI Vectorizer. Uh, this is automated feature recognition. The same way that we were working with that classification scheme, this automates uh, digitizing polygons from rasters. So if we have a paper map, we have an image that we need to create a vectorized image from. Some of these plugins will allow us to actually simply click the border of a shape and the program will infer what the border looks like for the rest of that time. And it will try to follow that image to correctly trace things. So here you can see they, they tap once and then twice at the beginning of those lines to show, hey, this is what the line looks like and then it tries to fill out the rest of it all on its own. Needs a little bit of a help at the end there, but nonetheless, this is a process that is so much faster than doing this by hand when you have a ton of things that you need to digitize. Um, this is a case of expediting a workflow, essentially. At this point, I am going to switch gears over to big data, but again, I wanna point out that there are plenty more uses for AI and GIS that are becoming relevant. They all stem from these same ideas generally about we are trying to expedite a task or we are trying to create new information from existing information. Talking about big data, I'm going to keep talking about AI and keep talking about machine learning, um, but I'm mostly going to focus on that data now, talking about the things that we are using to train these tools and to work with this. So when I talk about big data, what I mean is just big data. I'm talking about large data sets. 
Um, it comes in a lot of different forms, but truly what I am speaking to is millions and millions and millions of data points. It is the kind of data that 20 years ago was extremely hard to work with because we didn't have the tools, we didn't have the computing power to be able to go line by line through all this information in a reasonable amount of time. Although we might've had some computing power to be able to run these things over the course of a year when we're working with a million data points, it's not feasible. Whereas today, if we're running a regression on a million data points, it might take a few seconds, a few minutes, even an hour, still a good bit shorter than a year. Generally, when we're defining big data, we talk about the five Vs. Velocity refers to the speed at which this data is being produced, thousands, millions, billions of data points every second. Volume is volume, the size of this information. Uh, value is the potential takeaways that we can get from relying on big data. Variety is the variety of different sources and the different opportunities for drawing this information. And veracity is the potential for truth that we have from this data. Debatable, but. Some examples of big data would be genetics. So sequencing the human genome was a form of big data analytics going through and actually taking massive amounts of information and trying to draw conclusions from them, something that is very difficult to do by hand, but is possible. Um, and then remote sensing data, it's gonna keep coming back up. Uh, it's a form of big data because it is something that is available in large quantities over large amounts of time, uh, over massive geographic extents. Social media is also a very popular big data source when we're talking about the many, many users who do many interactions over a day. All of that information can be brought down and analyzed, visualized. Internet search engine, what people are searching online um, is being recorded and says a lot about who they are and what they're doing, things like that. Um, and then smart devices. Any smart device is a potential source for big data. And I want to spend an extra second on this. Smart devices tie into this idea of the internet of things. And put simply, this is simply that anything that connects to the internet is collecting information that is available to somebody. I'm talking about your cable box, your smart speaker, your smart printer, smart oven, smart fridge, your smart light bulb, video games, cameras, phones, laptops, tablets, everything, anything that you are interacting with is generating some form of information that is being collected, usually by the company that has created the thing or the software or the hardware or whatever it is. And that information is very often held by those individuals, but occasionally it is shared with other companies. And sometimes very rarely it is shared with the public. I think we've all gotten very familiar with this idea that Using social media, you get very targeted ads that you're not sure why you're getting or how you're getting, but you know are right. Um, that is in some part a result of this big data. Those micro interactions that you are having on these platforms add up to tell a full story about you. And so this information is always being collected when we're working with GIS, when we're doing research, this is an opportunity for us to leverage this data to some extent, but there are of course, many, many, many considerations that we have when doing so. So let's get into examples. It's the same image again, but I, I think it really works. Remote sensing is a form of big data simply because it is available for essentially the whole planet. Uh, it is often freely available. It has years and years and years of backlog. Um, the resolution is often up to the daily level, if not the semi-daily or the weekly. Um, and at the end of the day, each of these individual layers that are covering the whole planet, coming from satellite imagery, are just teeny tiny pixels. It is massive numbers of pixels, millions and millions of data points that are all being collected to form one single data set. So this is one classic form of big data. There's two other ones that I really want to spend some time on, though. First is big data in GIS. We're talking about location and mobility. Now, notice here I'm not saying the data source. I am saying more of the data functionality. We're talking about where and where next. In this case, this kind of information can come from a lot of different sources. 
Usually what we're talking about is cell phone data, either the cell phone itself or the apps that you're interacting with on your cell phone. They are collecting information and in particular, they are often collecting location information. That location information, if it is made available, can be used to map mobility patterns throughout the day. So in particular, this map is showing hotspots of people across a city using a specific data set. So we can actually see if we have this data that is temporal and geographic, we can look over the course of the day to see where people are traveling and when to see if it's impacted by weather, to see if it's impacted by holidays, by working days, all of these details, we suddenly have this massive amount of information we can be looking at in terms of location and mobility. We can look at this in practice in a little bit more depth. This example is from the publication Beyond Residence, a mobility-based approach for improved evaluation of human exposure to environmental hazards. The study proposed a mobility-based hazard exposure index looking at 239 counties, focusing on air pollution, extreme heat, and toxic sites. What does it all mean? The authors here were focusing on improving upon the standard hazard exposure analysis. The standard hazard exposure analysis is often taking census data, census tracts, census counties, uh, blocks, block groups, which is people's residence, and comparing hazards to that information. It's functional, it works, uh, it is very informative, but what we are missing out on is that people do not stay in their home all day. I do because I mostly work from home, but most people do not. A lot of people are traveling to some extent. And so the question was, does hazard exposure change if we take into consideration mobility? So the authors essentially looked at over the course of a certain period of time, over a few months, they wanted to see the people's data that they had, where did they go, how often did they go there, how much time did they spend, and were those new areas hazardous or more hazardous or less hazardous than the census tract that they resided in. What they found was that if individuals residing in high exposure areas were also more likely to travel to high exposure areas, which means that failing to take into account mobility underestimated their exposure. They also found that 1.16 million people estimated in the study spend 10% of their time in toxic site areas, despite not living in a toxic site census tract. So in this way, they improved upon the traditional environmental analysis using GIS, but taking in this big data in order to improve upon our understanding of people's exposure. The last type of big data I really wanna hit on here is location and sentiment. So we talked about where and where, now we're talking about where and how. Often when we're thinking about large data sets, we don't think that we have individual experience because that takes a lot of time to do surveys, to do interviews, or just to engage with a lot of people in a meaningful way. But as researchers, as analysts, we often crave that level of insight. So big data that is generated by those individuals' actions, such as through social media, through smart appliances, internet search engines, that might provide us with some form of that insight. So in the, this case, we're talking about uh, this paper here is the social media and disaster, human security, environmental racism and crisis communication in Hurricane Irma response by Sovaku et al 2020. This is an example of big data sentiment analysis using GIS and AI to examine tweets during Hurricane Irma. And I'm gonna to go to the next section here so it doesn't make y'all dizzy, I'll make that stop. Um, hurricane Irma was a category five hurricane, caused a lot of damage in Northeastern Caribbean in the Florida Keys. This study examined tweets to and from 16 local news stations before, during and after Hurricane Irma in Florida. The goal was to gain an understanding of the sentiment at those times to see what people were feeling, experiencing, asking for, talking about. And they used machine learning, alg machine learning algorithms 
to categorize the text within these tweets in order to gain some kind of understanding about people's experiences. The results from this analysis showed that secondhand and firsthand reports on disasters, severity, uh, safety, required assistance, those were the most prevalent categories of tweets. However, the third most prevalent topic of discussion was looting with a high number of users speaking specifically to the racialization of the events. On the one hand of the spectrum, users were countering news outlets and other users were uh, countering news outlets and other users who were implying that looting events could be tied to racial minorities, while other users were actively perpetuating this connection. Along the same line, um, tweets also surfaced discussing the apparent disparity in assistance received after the event, wherein the discussants said that wealthier communities appeared to be prioritized in the recovery phase. So in the case of this study, big data provided a unique level of insights into individuals experiencing experiences during a disaster event that might not have been gathered feasibly through any other means, not on this scale at the very least. So to summarize the takeaway here for big data and AI is generally speaking that AI and big data can provide unique, valuable insights on previously unthinkable scales. So we've talked about critical GIS, we've talked about big data and AI. I've said a lot of good things. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. Let's talk about the bias that we're seeing here. Um, this is where I'm going to give a quick um, overview again of bias in AI. I'm going to talk about an example one more time, and then we're going to get into some of the hands-on stuff and we can start playing around with uh, some of the tools and generating your own data as well. Um, and I apologize. I know I'm about to put a bunch of text on the screen. I know that you probably can't see all of it. It's okay. Um, I'm putting it up there because all the words I believe are important, but I will summarize and I will highlight the most important parts here. I think that the easiest way to begin this framing process is by considering the bias that we already know exists in AI and big data, the things that have already been categorized. And keep in mind that all this that I am pulling is from the IBM website. This is from a company that is a big advocate for the use of these tools. So first and foremost in healthcare, uh, underrepresented data of women and minority groups has skewed predictive AI algorithms in the past, leading to lower accuracy results for black patients than white patients. For applicant tracking systems, issues with natural language processing algorithms has arisen, in part because resumes with words like executed or captured were more commonly found on men's resumes and were also favored in the application tracking process. With regards to online advertising, biases in search engine ad algorithms can reinforce job role gender bias, where Google's online advertising system displayed high paying positions to males more often than to women. For image generation, research found that bias in generative AI art uh, was emerging as a result of, uh, in both younger and older people that were being displayed through the images. Older people were always men, reinforcing gendered bias of roles of women in the workplace. And this last one, AI powered predictive policing tools used by some organizations in the criminal justice system were used to identify areas where crime was likely to occur, but they often relied on historical arrest data which reinforced existing patterns of racial profiling and disproportionate targeting of minority communities. Now, the most important thing that I wanna point out with all of these examples is these things in red, the people that are being hurt by this bias, the people that are being marginalized are being further marginalized. This is not unique, this is not novel, these are the same biases that we see in our day-to-day -day lives and in other institutional processes, and they are being perpetuated and accentuated when we are creating these tools 
without programming those things out explicitly. So with these biases in mind, these are all the things that we have identified. These are cases where we have captured the bias and sought to address it. These are cases where these things have gone noticed. But with the explosion of AI, with the explosion of big data, with the overall popularity of these things, I would contend that there has not been time to catch every single case of bias in every single tool and data source. So when we're getting into working with GIS, we need to find ways to be able to assess these tools, the way that we construct them, assess these data, the way that we are using them. And so to give an example of this, I'm going to bring it all together for one more remote sensing example. I'm so sorry, but it's just, it's so perfect for explaining some of this stuff. Um, this paper in particular is uh, interrogating land cover categories, metaphor and method in remote sensing. This comes from the journal Cartography and Geographic Information Sciences. It was published online in 2013, but it was first published in the year 2000. Keep that in mind. Um, and this is by Robbins and Maddock from 2000. Generally speaking, we're talking once more about remote sensing imagery. Um, we're speaking specifically about image classification. So again, we are talking about using machine algorithms, machine learning algorithms, to classify images in order to identify the important things, identify and categorize things to tell this story that we are interested in. So with that in mind, this study specifically was done in Rajasthan, India. The language that I'm going to be referring to here was Marwaru. The goal of this study was to investigate how different groups understanding of local natural features informed how they classify or categorize remote sensing imagery. So we already understand that image classification means taking a sample of something, putting it into a category, and then running to essentially group every single pixel into one of these categories. In this case, the authors wanted to know, do different groups label natural resources differently leading to different final results. In this case, the groups that were investigated were foresters who were charged with identifying areas for protection and local farmers who actively relied upon the land. So this first image up here in the top left, and I promise I'll zoom in a second to, to get some more detail, um, but this is the image from the foresters. They went to a bunch of foresters and they said, Look at this map, classify these things into whatever categories you think are important. At the end of the day, this was essentially how things uh, worked out. The classifications are not classified, forest, cultivated, urban or bare, and grassy. The next classification they did was referencing locals, talking to farmers in particular, and this was the result of that classification process. So the categories here are intended to line up with the categories for the forester map. So going down the list, they're going to be in approximately the same order, making approximately the, an equivalent classification. So it goes not classified, junglat, which is tree cover or forest, keti, which is cultivated sites, banjar, which is an orange that is degraded, bare, or village, and akad, which is grass, fallow, or coverage fallow coverage. So in this case, I want to highlight some specific differences. You can already see in the maps overall that the local map has a lot more yellow. It has a lot more orange. It's just got a lot more pop going on. But I want to hone in on this specific area here that I think really conveys this well. This top image for the forest, you can see that there is a little orange, but it is mostly classified as forest. Whereas in that same area for the, the locals classification, we see a lot more orange, a lot more of that bear or urban area, and a lot less of that junglat, the forested area. So first and foremost, junglat translates to scrub forest, and that doesn't necessarily line up with forest rangers definitions. However, 
foresters defined more areas as forest and local producers recognized more areas as degraded for a very good reason is what they discovered. Most areas where there was this disagreement, foresters saying forest, locals saying barren, was where there was this invasive species known as Mexican mesquite. Locals knew that this invasive species hampered the development of these areas and made them unfit for any kind of cultivation. Foresters, on the other hand, recognized this as a form of greenery and in turn requiring some kind of protection. So locals saw it as degradation, foresters saw it as greenery. Clearly in this case, the use of machine learning techniques effectively classified the imagery, but depending on who you asked, it might not have been a true reflection of local needs of where local resources should be put. So the authors in this case say, referring to what the results show and what must be done to adapt and improve land use and land cover classification procedures, they say, quote, ultimately, this means surrendering the scientific categories of analysis to social debate and allowing local visions of the landscape to drive the search for and analysis of environmental change using remote sensing in GIS. And again, this is 2000. This is, this is a long time ago they were working on this stuff. But I think that this is really applicable for our thinking of critical GIS today. I want to just hit some final considerations before we start digging into things. Um, I'll ask for your thoughts and feedbacks as best we can with the, the mixed hybrid format as we get into this. Um, but some additional considerations when working with AI and big data are generally, first and foremost, demographics. Uh, demographics of the users, demographics of the creators. We often do not know the exact race, gender, language, income, age of the people that are creating these tools or that are generating this data. So even though we are using these things and we want to assess bias, we don't always have all the information available to us that can help with that. Privacy is obviously a very big concern. Um, data privacy, who gets to keep this data? Who gets to keep these tools? How often should we be promoting further data collection in the, same, in the name of science, knowing that it's not going to be used solely for good? And same thing with tools. How often are we promoting these really powerful tools? How often are we trying to convince people to build more of them and create more um, transparency. We're thinking about how was the data collected? How was the tool created? How were things sorted, aggregated, validated, et cetera? Do we know for certain that these are people that are cre creating some of these data, in particular for big data? Um, when we're working with like social media, when we're looking at Google search engines, that data is not always all created by different individuals and is not always a reflection on different individuals' intentions. Uh, the creation of bots is a very popular example of that. On social media, um, bots can post whatever they want and say whatever they want and occasionally don't get caught. And same thing for search engines. Bots can search something again and again and again, skewing our data. Google, for example, tries to remove that from their data sets, but it's not always caught. Another really important thing to consider when using these things in GIS and using these things in research is what is the company motive? A lot of the time when we are getting access to these tools and these data, the goal of the company is not necessarily to give us tools to do better research. Usually the goal is to make a profit in some respect or to gain popularity in some respect. Um, so what was the goal of that collecting entity or that generating entity? Were they just trying to collect data to have data? Were they trying to do it to um, make some kind of impact? And with that, um, thinking about social media and things, what is going on that is um, causing any kinds of cyclical promotion? And by that, I mean, do platforms reward certain types of activity over others? And if they do, what are those promotions? Are they explicit or do we have to infer them? Uh, a lot of the time there are certain types of content that get taken down and there are other types of content that are just more inherently popular based off of how the platform is designed. All things that we need to take into consideration. And then finally, individual motive. 
kind of restating the same thing, but this is particularly applicable for big data. Um, when we think about drawing on data from things like social media, we don't know why people are using social media the way they are. They don't, we don't know if they're posting exactly what they're thinking or if they're posting truthfully or if they're posting for themselves or for somebody else, or maybe there's an event going on that has got people posting. Um, I know that when, GI, or when uh, Game of Thrones was really popular, I was tweeting about Game of Thrones and trying to win Game of Thrones things. I don't think that's a very good reflection of who I am if you were to use that data now, but it's out there in the world. It still tells a little bit about myself and is going to be incorporated if we're not careful. So let's do some stuff. We have all of these, these ideas in mind now. We have all these considerations to be thinking about. Let's go to the first tool, um, go to our first little exploration here. I am going to try to drop this in the chat if I can. Um, it should be at the top of the chat already, but I'm gonna try to drop one more time. I'll click the link to get that he's gonna put in the chat if you're not on Zoom. If you want the data or the links, go there. Let's see. Yeah, for those of you that are on the Zoom and have access there, can I paste? No, I can't. Um, what we're going to do is this is just going to be a very high level investigation of, thank you for that. I can't see the copy or paste. My keyboard has given up on me all of a sudden, but I think I can still get into this. What we are going to look at here is a very high level investigation of applying critical GIS when working with big data and AI. So I'll give everybody a moment. Um, Click into that link in the chat there. You absolutely do not have to follow along for this. Um, I want to provide this link to allow you to do your own investigation and to see what kind of takeaways you get uh, playing around with this data. Um, but you can also just follow along and see what I see. I'll show you what I got going on. Um, generally speaking, let me grab my slides so I have my notes. What we are looking at here is data that I am using. Thank you for posting that, y'all. Beautiful. Um, this data here is essentially data that we used for a publication that went out last year. Um, this is Twitter data. We were intending to investigate the relationship between what people tweet about and the environmental injustices they might experience. So what we have on this map is quite simply aggregated, anonymized, generalized tweets. On this top layer, we have individual points. Every point represents a number of tweets. On the bottom layer, we have block groups. So I'll give everybody another minute to get that up. I'll just keep chatting through it. Um, the goal of our study was thinking about, uh, there are a lot of environmental justice tools. Um, in particular, California has tools like CalEnviroScreen. Uh, there are national tools like EJScreen. These tools are used for directing resources for environmental justice projects, right? Um, so our interest, our investigation in these topics often revolves around the use of these tools because it is simplifying this very complex idea of environmental injustice. But what we were wondering was, is there a way to make a tool that is more dynamic, that is more up to date? Traditional environmental justice tools are relying on static data, census data, annually collected environmental data, a lot of things that have to be um, interpolated and don't necessarily reflect individual experience. So we wanted to see, is social media a source of information that we can use for inferring environmental justice. Before we dove into that head first, before we just started using AI and machine learning algorithms to make these connections, we took a step back and we said, what is the relationship that we see here that might cause some bias? And so we actually plotted things in relation to traditional environmental justice characteristics to investigate this relationship. So in this map here, if you're in ArcGIS Online, over in the top left, you can get into the layers. And we have two groups of layers. The bottom layer is block groups. So in here, if I zoom into one of these block groups and I click on 
any one of these polygons. Just love how slow things get when you're presenting. I knew it was going to happen. Uh, but when you click on one of these polygons, you'll see that the information that we have inside of here is a ton of different socio-demographic economic information. We have data on income for households. We have race. We have age, education, poverty, public assistance, disability, English, female-headed households, lots and lots of different information. We can visualize this map by changing the style to look at these things individually, if that's something you want to investigate. In order to do that, on the left side under layers, all you have to do is click on the layer that you want to visualize differently. So in this case, we're going to visualize all block groups to be a little bit different based off of data that's available. So I'll click on all block groups. And over here on the right side, I'll go into the styles pane. So again, you click on the layer that you want to change the visualizations for. And then the styles pane is this little icon that's got shapes on it. And this allows us to do two things. We first choose an attribute that we want to visualize by. And second, we'll adjust the way that we are visualizing them. So I'm going to click Add Field under Choose Attributes. And you can choose whatever field you want to investigate because there's plenty of things to be seen, plenty of things to investigate. There are plenty of conclusions to be drawn here between the relationship um, of these tweets and these different factors. But in particular, I am going to look at the proportion of white alone. And I'm going to reverse this to show me communities of color. So I'm going to show first this top style that it has here, counts and amounts color. It'll take just a second to power up here. But what this is doing is this is showing me high to low of this proportion of white alone. And to help me understand what I'm looking at here, on the far left, we have the legend. On the left side here, it's about halfway down. It's got little icons and lines next to them. If you click on that, that'll actually pop up the legend so you can see exactly what it is that we're visualizing. Um, but I'm going to play around with the style option just a little bit. So right now I have high to low proportion of population white alone. I'm gonna come over to pick a style. I'm gonna do style options. And I'm actually going to flip the color ramp. So it's down here, there's this little button with the up and down arrows. I'm going to click that to flip it. And that's going to allow me to show areas that are darker as being areas with higher proportions of people of color. And here comes the cat. Coming to visit. Um, so now that I have this visualized, and you can choose whatever field you want to visualize by, what I'm going to do is I want to focus in on the relationship between these tweets and these characteristics. I want to see if I am going to do an analysis that uses block groups and uses tweets, what is the immediate relationship that I'm seeing if I'm making that association? If I'm going to aggregate these tweets to these block groups, what am I going to see happen? So I'm going to zoom in and just kind of cruise around, see what I've got going on. In this case, we have a lot of tweets. We have a lot of stuff going on, um, mostly on the right side of the map, mostly in the east. We are seeing a high, high density of points, high number of tweets, a lot of stuff going on. Um, so I'm going to actually start to cut this down a little bit so we can get a better look at it. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the layers here in the top left. And I'm going to turn off. No, I think I'll actually leave it on. I'm going to leave all block groups on but I'm also going to turn on block groups with tweets. What this is going to do is it's going to show me only the block groups which have tweets. And I'm actually going to turn off the all tweets layer to help me see this. And it's going to take a second to visualize. But now what I can see is there are some gaps that I have. There's some block groups that disappear because they have zero tweets associated with them. And so I start to see some gaps appearing um, I lose a few dozen in a few different areas. I've got some bigger gaps here. I can see as you get further out, we lose some of those bigger block groups, some of those chunkier ones. Uh, we do have most of the big ones out here, though. The modifiable area unit problem tells us that simply because a point is or a uh, block group is larger, it will probably capture at least one point. 
And we're kind of seeing that manifest here where we're losing a lot of those smaller ones. But I wanna hone in just a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna focus in and actually, I'm going to turn off block groups with tweets and I'm going to turn on tweets with quote EJ words. This is where we really wanted to hone in. We wanted to see if we were only looking at posts that had some textual content that we thought related to environmental justice, how was that different from the general distribution of tweets? And you can immediately see here, it's a lot less tweets that we're looking at. You can click on any one of these circles and it'll show you how many tweets are actually there. There's three in this point. But across the board, the distribution is approximately similar. We still have a lot in the east, a lot on the right side there, but it is thinned out quite a bit across the board. And so I can actually do the same thing with the block groups now. I can cut the block groups down to only the ones that have environmental justice tweets to further visualize what we're working with. In our analysis, our goal was to aggregate the points to the block groups so we could do a comparison. We could run a spatial regression between these two counts, between the count and between the sociodemographic economic variables. I'm going to turn off those tweets now so I can see this better. And now what we're looking at is everything in green is a tweet with an environmental or a block group with an environmental justice tweet. And everything that is in blue showing those symbolization by race in this case are block groups that were removed because they had zero tweets. I lose a lot of information here across the board. Um, these are only tweets from a three, four month period. So maybe if I had a longer period, I had more data, I would be able to capture more of these, but it is interesting to see what the distribution of this loss is. Um, and this is the point where if, if you've got specific things that you notice that you think are really interesting, pop them into the chat, hop on mic, do whatever. Um, I'll keep chugging along here. Um, I'm gonna try to get onto the last tool soon and wrap up. I knew I could have spoken for three hours and I just need to rein it in a little bit. Um, but in this case, this was just an opportunity to start looking into what was lost in this process. When we started to cut down tweets, who are we now capturing? And there are a lot of different ways to think about this. There are a lot of different reasons this is important. But in this case, the reason that we cared about this is we are studying this for the purpose of creating an environmental justice tool. Environmental justice in the United States is closely tied to race and income in particular. With that in mind, this simple explore, exploration shows us that we are losing a lot of the block groups that have higher proportions of people of color. Yes, you can absolutely also type questions here as well. Thank you. Um, we lose a lot of data and what that data was can say a lot about what our final tool is going to look like. So for the purpose of this exploration, this is all I really wanted to show. Um, for the paper itself, we went on and did a lot more work after this. We moved the resolution up to the track level. We controlled by population. We tried to address some of these issues. Um, I won't go too much into detail on this right now, um, but this is something that is very impactful as we start thinking about uh, analyzing this big data and using AI and machine learning that would certainly give us a functional result, but one that might not reflect the reality of the situation here in New Jersey. Um, I am gonna start transitioning over to the next one. I'm gonna see if I can punch this into chat. Is it gonna work for me? Man. This next tool that we are going to work with, there we go, now I got it. I gotta post it, I did it. Uh, this next tool that we're gonna work with is going to show you how to create your own big data from a very popular tool um, and how to analyze it for use in GIS. Uh, that tool is Google Trends. Um, you can start navigating to that website. I will show you how to use it in just a moment. Um, Google Trends for this, uh, practice. We're going to look at three different things if we have time, uh, maybe just two. Uh, we're going to look at a very popular pop artist. We're going to look at a very important social movement. 
And we're also going to look at an environmental disaster to see how the three pan out over this big data set, to see what we can infer from that information, how we can analyze that in GIS, and what we need to consider in doing so. Let me actually get back now. Cool, so I've got Google Trends open. Again, if you wanna follow along, you can, absolutely don't have to. You can just watch me type stuff in. Um, Google Trends, broadly speaking, is a tool that is used for capturing the relative frequency with which people are searching a given term over time and space. In other words, this is a tool that tells us how many people Googled something over time and across regions. This tool is free, it is open access. Um, there is not an API technically, but there are Python and R and Java and all these different packages that will allow you to link directly into it and to automate your own um, data download processes. Super handy. Um, and for the first example here, I know that we are tired of hearing about this. I know that this is very popular and everybody's using it, but I can't help but use it because I think it's a very good example for this case. We're going to look at Taylor Swift. Now, before I search, before I hit that button, I'm typing this name in. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use a topic instead of a query. And this is very, very helpful. Wild that Zane is the first thing that pops up. That's interesting. Anyways, Taylor Swift, I type it in. And what you'll see here is I have a couple of suggestions. If I use one of these suggestions called topics, I will get a wider array of data than if I just press the explore button. What this means is if I press explore, all that it's going to show me is people who have searched for that exact phrase. So it will be capital T, capital S, Taylor Swift, nothing else. I will see people who search that exact thing. If, however, I want to capture a wider variety, for example, I want to catch Taylor Swift lowercase. I want to catch people who are looking for her albums, people who are looking for her concerts, people who searched Taylor Swift and accidentally misspelled the name. All of those things will be captured in a category. So right here, this topic, I'm going to click that instead of just doing the search. This is particularly helpful for equity analyses because we are actually able to capture additional languages when we are using the topic function. So if we're using uh, individual words, we're using actual words instead of names. Um, for example, if I was searching watermelon, if I search topic for watermelon, I'll get watermelon in different languages as well as the watermelon in English. So it helps to capture a wider variety um, and this is very important because this is a global tool. We can look at all across the world. We can look at the United States. We can look at subregions, so on and so forth. Um, so we pick the topic, American singer songwriter, Taylor Swift. Um, from left to right here, these tools, these allow us to hone in on subregions. So we can do worldwide. We can pick a specific country. We can pick a specific geography beyond that. So for example, jumping down here to the subregion, I can click California and it zooms into California. I can do subregions of California, getting into the metro. I can even do cities if there is enough information. If there is not a high amount of searches, you will not get data back. But if there is enough information, if there are enough people searching, it will pop up. So I can see the relative search frequency for people by city. I think I remember Davis, y'all fall into you know, like number 12 or something like that. Anyways, um, you can actually see the relative search into interest based on location, still based on time. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to go back, I'm going to do United States and I'm going to set my time frame, which is the second tool here. And I'm going to set it to all time, which is 2004 to present. That's as far back as this goes. You also have the option to choose categories in web search. Categories means you can narrow down to arts, entertainment, auto vehicle, all these different things. These different search functions mean you can narrow it down to just web search, just image search, news, Google shopping, or even YouTube. 
which is really helpful. Now, what's very important here is that I keep saying that this is relative data. What that means is that this data has been aggregated, anonymized, and standardized. Standardized in the sense that we are not seeing absolute values of searches. We don't know how many people exactly were searching things. We only know how many people were searching relatively across time. So in this case, a peak of 100 means that in that time frame or across that area, that is the highest amount of searches out of all of those. 50 means that there were half as popular, half as many searches. Zero means there's not enough data for that search term. This data is standardized for a couple of different reasons. Um, privacy being one of the most principal. Being able to see that one person searched a search term in this one area in New York in that tiny little apartment is very uh, problematic. You can dox somebody really easily based on their searches if you get specific enough. So they try to anonymize that. But the standardization process, importantly, also takes into consideration things like population of searches. So New York will not always be the top area because it is taking into consideration the total number of searches in those areas and standardizing by that as well. Important to consider, that's what it says in the documentation. We don't get to see that process. We don't know what data they are removing. We don't know what data, how exactly they are standardizing these things. Um, so we do lose a little bit of information. This is a big data black box for us. We don't get all of the details here. Um, what I wanna look at next is we can look at the different subregions here to see how things break out. We can see over time, how have there been rises and falls it has notes for changes to geographic assignment and changes to data collection systems. And down here near the bottom, we have two important tools, related topics, so topics that this might fall into. And my favorite is related queries. Here, if I switch over from rising to top, I will actually see who was searching other search terms, what other search terms were being uh, entered after this one. If people were looking for this search, these other things might have been related. They might have searched this next. They might have searched this first. They might have seen a relationship here. But we can use these to extend our search to get additional information based off of the relative frequency of these secondary queries. So to do a very quick um, comparison here, quick example. Everybody, of course, knows that there was a lot going on with this gentleman, Travis Kelsey. Um, I know very little about any of this stuff. I can name maximum four Taylor Swift songs, but because of this tool, um, I am able to tell you that Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift started dating in September of 2023. Why do I know that? We see a very strange uptick in both of their searches at the exact same time. And I can narrow down this time range to see this in a little bit more detail. Here at the bottom of the time ranges, I have a custom time range. I can punch in to go all the way up to, let's say, I'm just gonna go to 2023. I'll use that. And keeping in mind that this is relative, what was 100 in that first time frame is not going to be 100 in this time frame necessarily. Things are going to fluctuate. And all of this is sample of data. This is sampled data. Um, Google is not going through all of the data for you to pull this information. It is doing it just as a sample of the master data set. So if you do this again and again, you get slightly different results. So if you want to ensure that you're being accurate for data collection, you need to do this again and again and to average things out. Um, but zoom, zooming in here, you can see we have this sudden spike in September uh, where the two of them gain popularity in searches. So you can see that something is going on. Um, additionally, if you want to download any of this data, this button right here will download a CSV of all of these individual values over time. That is a very helpful function when you're looking to map these things out spatially and temporally, um, if you're looking to do an analysis. So what you can do is you can actually use different packages to automate this process, to go region by region, to pull the data, to average things out, and to give you a final relative search frequency index. So let's zoom in a little bit now 
Um, this is one example. You can search whatever you want, whatever you're interested in. But one example that I want to give now um, is specific to a big environmental catastrophe from a couple of years back. So I'm going to search the search term lead. And again, this is a time to not search lead as an individual search term, but to use it as a category, as a um, topic. That is because in the English language, L-E-A-D has a lot of different meanings. Uh, it can be construed in a lot of different ways, lead, 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 lead. Um, but I'm focused on the chemical element in particular. So I want to punch that in. I'm going to go back to all time, 2004 to present. And I am going to hone in on a specific area. I'm going to go to the subregions. I'm going to go to Michigan. And then I'm going to focus in on a specific area in Michigan that is Flint, Saginaw Bay City, Michigan area. So this was an investigation that we did thinking about using big data. The original popularity of this tool came about in, I think it was 2013. Yes, uh, from a paper by Andrea Freyer Dugas and others. Um, this was the Google flu paper. Essentially, the authors were Google engineers who were seeking to identify if you could predict rises in Google flu or uh, in uh, influenza outbreaks before the CDC was able to make those predictions themselves. And so they did something like this where they were trying to pair um, outcomes and experiences and CDC data with searches prior to that. They used AI, they used machine learning, and they were able to predict outbreaks up to a week before the CDC published their data. Now that was a while ago. Um, it was done, it worked. However, it was hard to repeat because people are changing their behavior. People are changing the ways they interact with this data, with these platforms. Uh, these platforms are changing what's available. That was back in the day when this data was available in absolute values rather than just relative. Um, so things change. It's not as easy. But the question is, can we use this free data to do something similar with a different kind of disaster? And so what we investigated in a comment paper that we've got out in review right now is, can you see any kind of warning sign for the Flint, Michigan water crisis? Now, there was plenty of data that was collected during the crisis that pointed to there is an issue that needs to be addressed, um, but there was still a very slow response. The idea here is that if we can prove some kind of correlation between events and searches for terms like this, maybe this is another data set that we can use to provide evidence to lead to responses that are a little bit faster that can result in less harm at the end of the day. So I can tell you that the Flint water crisis began in 2014. The announcement of the Flint water crisis was January of 2016. That is when the governor came out and made a public announcement, state of emergency, this is an issue that is going on. That is where we see the biggest spike in the search for the word lead chemical element in this time. And importantly, if we scroll down, Related queries include lead water, what is lead, lead water, lead levels, lead tests, so on and so forth. I point this in the direction that there is some kind of association going on here. And we can see that there is a small uptick before this massive one, but this crisis did begin in 2014. So there is a lot of fluctuation. There's a lot of noise in the data. There's a lot of things going on. This might not be the perfect indicator, but we can compare it to additional indicators to try to identify if there's some kind of correlation going on. In this case, we used Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease is a affliction that is caused by Legionelle bacteria. It's associated with unclean or untreated water. Uh, there was an outbreak of Legionnaire's disease around the same time that this crisis was going on as a result of the same problems. And what we can see here is there is just the slightest rise in Legionnaire's disease searches prior to the searches for lead. So that Legionnaire's disease outbreak paired with the spike in lead searches might give us a little bit more of a tip off that, hey, there is some kind of crisis going on here. Hey, there are issues with water. 
This is not perfect by any stretch. Using these tools by themselves is usually not sufficient. Generally speaking, uh, we need to pair these in models with other factors in order to be able to draw meaningful conclusions. And even then, as we've talked about, there are a lot of things to take into consideration. Um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go too deep into this very last one, but I am just gonna search it real quick to give you an idea. And you can always search this on your own time if you're interested. Oop, no, I did. I can't spell apparently. Um, this last example that I wanted to give was for this term woke. This is a term that originally emerged in the 1920s and 30s. Um, it came from a song, uh, it was popularized from a song by the um, Lead Belly was the name of the artist. Scottsboro Boys was the name of his song. Um, this term originally meant to stay aware of racially motivated threats. However, it's changed in meaning a lot over the years. And something that, this is just me kind of investigating this relationship. In theory, this term would, in its original form, in its original meaning, have some kind of alignment with searches for things like Black Lives Matter over space and time. But this term is something that has changed dramatically in recent years. You can see when we look at just the term, it has very little popularity until recently. You can see here it starts to go up in 2020. Whereas when we look at it in comparison to Black Lives Matter, there is a rise in the term around that time, but it continues to rise after that, even though there is a decline in interest for the search term Black Lives Matter. Woke has been co-opted as a pejorative to mean performative activism, and it has been used to attack people more than to convey that original sentiment. And seeing how that's changed alongside the movement is really interesting to think about how these words are intended to be used, how they are used in time, how they change in time, and how you can tell a lot of different stories with the same data, depending on how you adjust these graphs. So you have to be very careful when other people are saying that they are using big data, when they're using tools like this, when they're relying on words like these, and in your own research, in your own work with GIS, when you're trying to plot these things across space and time, Relying on big data like this is beneficial, but carries with it bias that changes over time and over space. So really keep, important to keep in mind. A couple minutes left. I'm gonna switch over to the slide again. Um, we're gonna wrap up. I'll give a quick conclusion. Um, and then if we have time, uh, I'll take some questions as well, if there are any. So overall, this was the topic, practical and critical GIS in the era of big data and AI. But the takeaways that I have for you here for this section were simply that maps and AI and big data are insightful, but they are human constructs to challenge and to improve upon at all times. So to conclude, these were the different sections we talked about. We introduced this idea that big data and AI are relevant because they are something that is becoming increasingly popular, increasingly powerful, but at the same time, they are something that needs to be increasingly scrutinized. We talked about how with critical GIS, maps are always a human construct. They should always be challenged in order to be improved upon to ensure that they are doing the best job that they can and they are telling the truest story that they can. We learned that AI and big data can provide revolutionary insights. These are tools and data sets that are doing revolutionary things for us. But at the same time, these maps and the AI and big data are insightful human constructs that we must seek to challenge and improve upon if we are to ensure that they are being used in the most effective manner. Quick little list of acknowledgements. Um, my co-author and advisor, Dr. Dan Lin Yu, um, I would not be able to do any of this without him by any stretch. Um, I learned GIS because before starting the program, he said, you know GIS, right? And I said, yeah. And then I learned GIS. Uh, so greatly appreciate him for all of that, of course, and for all the research help. Um, my collaborators in my lab group are Gift Favalud and Anvi Vu. Uh, they are both uh, huge, hugely helpful for a lot of this work. 
Um, I get funding as well from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, this grant has been a big help in our most recent research, which we're working on, identifying lead using big data and systems dynamics modeling. Um, and of course, I'm coming from Montclair State, uh, the College of Science and Mathematics, Department of Earth and Environmental Studies. Um, I would not know how to do all these things without the insights and the learning that I've gotten from the department. I have a list of citations here. Um, I won't spend too much time on it because I have links to all these things for you. Um, on the left side is a QR code for my information. This is my ORC ID. So if you want to find my research, my contact info, you can use that left QR code. The right QR code is the slide deck itself with all of the links, all of the citations. So you can go to that link and you can get all that stuff. Um, I know you got to use a phone, but you can email the link to yourself too. Um, but with that, thank you all so, so much for being here. Thank you all for all of this. Um, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, CJ. This was great talk. I really appreciated all of not only the information, but being able to like see how to do some of the searching. Um, Google Trends is something I played with a lot. So it, that was really interesting to hear about like not only how to get the data, but things about it. Um, so in the room, folks, if you have questions, we have this handy dandy mic. So speaking of Taylor Swift, you can have this wonderful microphone. Um, or if you're on Zoom, also you could unmute and ask your question there, but that way um, folks on Zoom can hear. Um, folks on Zoom, feel free to put questions in the chat or I am when it's appropriate to unmute and ask a question. Um, like Emily has her hand raised on Zoom. I do, hello. Um, thank you so much for a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you. This work is so important and uh, yeah. I have a question for you that is very tangentially related but I'm just interested in your take on this topic. So no worries if you like don't have anything brilliant to say or if you don't have anything to say at all. Um, I am a forest ecologist. Uh, I work with a group here at UC Davis and we are working with a lot of big data ourselves. We use commercial drones to collect forest ecology data uh, which is really cool because we work in like really remote and rugged areas and it takes actual humans like so long to go collect tons of on the ground data. So the fact that we can fly drones and like get these huge footprints of data is really cool for the kind of work that we do. Um, we're working on creating a bunch of like open source uh, deep machine learning based tools to kind of like quantify different aspects of forest structure and composition. Uh, right now we're working on identifying trees to species. Um, very cool work, but as you can probably imagine, like we wanna make this open source so that it's useful to different researchers, to like forest managers, conservation groups, things like that. Um, but it would be so easy for these algorithms to be repurposed towards very nefarious ends, right? Like the same algorithm that can be used to identify trees to species could definitely be used to identify people to skin color and like selectively drone strike them or like be used in policing operations to like racially profile people. Uh, and we don't want this to happen. Um, but it's been really hard to figure out like how to come up with a plan that addresses this. Uh, and interestingly, to me at least, a lot of other ecologists working in the same space actively collaborate with like defense companies and military companies uh, just because like they're creating similar types of tools. And I think it's really easy to kind of like in the case of ecology, for example, assume that your work is like politically neutral at best, because like we care about climate change and like forests. Um, but I'm just wondering if you have any like interesting takes on this or like recommendations for resources we could check out uh, or anything like that. What a cool question. What a cool project too. That is excellent. Um, 
Yeah, across the board, I absolutely know what you mean. I think that generally speaking, this development of new tools has an opportunity to be co-opted and used in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different manners by a lot of different people. And there is this, um, I guess, predisposition to turn to different organizations with the capital that can be used to expedite these processes and to improve these tools. Um, in a lot of cases, um, companies that are funded for reasons of defense or criminal enforcement are often better funded. They have better data. They have all these things that are very tempting. But on the other hand, I think one of the ways to go about trying to avoid this kind of thing, and it's, it's not the easiest thing to do, but I think it is effective when it does work, is building communities that have power in similar manners to similar extents, often through different avenues. And by that, I mean um, connecting with others who are ecologists, who are focused on using these tools for similar reasons, for, for things that we have an understanding of and that we want to see them used for, and relying and leaning on each other to do the research and training and development with one another. Because resources are one of the biggest, uh, the biggest um, issues with regards to creating these things is we need to have training samples we need to have somebody who understands the code. We need to have a, a very basic um, outline that we can build upon to improve upon. Um, and having these communities gives us this opportunity to share the workload and to share the resources and to share the understanding to improve upon these things in safer spaces. I don't believe that there is any way to ever fully confine these things. Um, but on the flip side of things, because there are so many more resources and so much more interest in developing these things in private spaces as well. A lot of the times these things that we are trying to create have been created. It's just that they are proprietary and they are closely guarded. Um, the nice thing about being here in New York is I get to meet a lot of people that are interested in these topics. One of my friends that is um, getting his PhD in um, neural networks in particular, his issue is that everything that he is studying, he always discovers somebody has already done it, somebody has already perfected it, but they are a part of a company who is using it for their own reasons and who is not willing to share it. Um, so I think the, maybe not the perfect solution by any stretch, but I think one of the best things that we can do is to try to foster that community and share that information among one another, because there are opportunities for us to gather this information and gather these resources and expedite the creation of these things for the right purpose in an attempt to try to avoid some of these uh, easier pitfalls of relying on sources that are going to use them for other intentions. Thanks for your question. Thank you, Jacob, I appreciate it. Any other questions or anything that I can answer? Let's all hang out and be best friends. Check me out at the QR code. I'm on all the social media platforms. I love keeping up with the work that people do in this space. There are so many different things for people to get into and there's so many different things that are happening all the time. And so building this community is, is a very, very important thing in my mind. Thank you so much, CJ. Um, I had a quick question. I guess when you are looking at data and you're trying to, I think it's probably instilled in you already, like the critical lens, but what kind of questions come to mind when you are looking at them to be critical? Like, are you, I know that you have your philosophy around data, like maps are incorrect and things like that, but what other questions come to mind when you are looking at maps and trying to um, be critical of them? I think, um, thanks for the question. Um, the question was about the, the uh, I think everybody could hear that, but just in case the, the questions that we can ask when we're assessing um, AI and big data for use in GIS, what specifically should we be looking to and what kind of questions do I ask when I go about this process? Um, I think the two biggest things that I'm generally thinking about are um, who was involved in the process and what is the intention of the company? Um, because in all cases, those are the two things that I usually cannot control, cannot get the information on, I can only make assumptions about. Um, and so I try my best to find ways to get that information to some extent, 
to use my knowledge and other people's knowledge and experiences to expand on those things. Um, when it comes to individuals, I'm thinking about the users, I'm thinking about the person who was responsible for generating the data, for creating the tools. Um, and I think about their intentions. A lot of the time as you are, when you have 2 million tweets that you are digging through and reading through and trying to figure out what to do with, you see a lot, a lot, a lot of different behavior. You see a lot of different posts. And it's strange to think about why people use these platforms for different reasons. Um, and that's part of the reason that I still use these social media platforms to this day. Um, this data isn't, isn't available really anymore. Uh, the new fun platform of X doesn't share these things widely or freely anymore. Um, but I, I like to start thinking about those things. I try to bring in what I understand as the, the purpose interaction is for these individuals on the platform. And then I think about the company and what I am seeing about what they have publicized for their intentions, what their goals are. Um, Google is always a fun one to think about because on the one hand, it is a source of information. It is the source of information a lot of the time. But even though it has become so universal, that does not mean that it does not have its bias and trying to figure out what it is striving to do uh, and what the, the um, behaviors and propensities are forcing the data to look like is, is really interesting. Um, and so I like to dig into what the news cycle is saying about what they've got going on. I like to look up what individuals who have worked for the company are saying they're trying to do. Um, I'm lucky enough to have a few friends in this world that I can ask hey, why did they do that? Or, hey, what, why does this look like this? Um, everything is wrong all the time and I just want to poke it apart until it falls apart. Um, but generally speaking, to answer your question in a shorter hand, I think about who and I think about why um, for both the company and the people that are creating, generating these tools and these data. Thanks for that. Uh, any other questions in the room? Any other questions online? Seeing any coming in, so um, I guess we can we can wrap this up. CJ, thank you so much for um, talking to us today about this. This is one of the topics that we really haven't had a chance to cover yet in the last few years of map time data. So um, this gave me a lot to think about. I know, <laughs> and I think a lot of other folks as well. So. Thank you so much for taking the time to zoom in with us. I think this has been really useful for a lot of folks. My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, y'all. Um, if anybody's going to AAG, I'll see y'all in a couple months. Um, but I really appreciate y'all having me here. Thank you so much.